because what you do with something with, with having to do with, with baptism really does matter. What people understand are accomplished. So, you know, we were, I was talking to a young fella who just recently baptized his baby. And I asked, well, what was accomplished? And he said, well, you know, it's like circumcision. I said, well, what's like circumcision? <laughs> well, you circumcise a baby, but what do you do with a female? I mean, come on, let's think this through a little bit. What do you do? What is it? If you're going to compare circumcision to baptism, what are you talking about? Because it's a ridiculous comparison to me, just absolutely ridiculous. But there's religions that actually teach that very thing. You'll, you'll come across it in Lutheranism, right? You'll come across that in that understanding, and that's the way they compare it. Now, with this person that I was talking to, were they teachable? Mm mm. Well, baby isn't teachable. And the question, I'll get back to you in just a second. And then I asked this question, what, again, what was accomplished? Because it wasn't something the baby did, it's something you did to the baby. So what did you think was being accomplished by baptizing the baby? Did you think it was removing sin? Did you think it was... Uh, uh, a safety net. What did you think was being accomplished by baptizing this baby? And I basically got no answer. There was no answer. Gee. There's a, uh, a struggle within Chris, Christendom, say that, between biblical truths and tradition. There are traditions that are held that you have to go through confirmation and things, and then you're a member of the Catholic Church, the real church, but they don't teach you about the Bible. Mm -hmm. When I became a Christian, I got hungry to read the Bible, and my wife got angry. You're jealous. <laughs> because they never taught her that. Well, you know, if there's some things to be angry over, that's not a bad thing. Yes. I think you nailed it with the questions. How? In my, yeah. for me personally, it's why. Why do I do the things I do when I'm a sinner? I'm broken. And we're all broken. Why did Jesus lay down his life for us? So that's what I struggle with every day. And that, that why is because my Lord and Savior loves us. He loved the people that follow after him, his people. And we are his people. And, and that's the yearning I I desire to have for my children. Yeah. I want them to yearn for that. Yeah. And yeah. if they don't, it drives me out of my mind because I love this. I love my Lord Jesus, and I want them to love him just as much. But yeah. what, how and why is the question, and how we address this. And it's, it's out of the love of our heart that we yearn for him and we follow after him. Yeah, yeah. there's no question. But religion sets up, and I'll get to you in a second. Mm -hmm. Religion has a lot of hoops, right? And we, we call them traditions, we call them rituals, we call them whatever you want to do. But religion has, just has one hoop after another. Oh, go through this one, you'll be okay. Go through this one, you'll be fine. My husband's family believes in baby baptism. And um, when I attended that one, they think that that child is not going to go to heaven if right. they're not baptized. Right. And it was a real interesting because David's sister came up to me and said, oh, <coughs> the parents now are going to go to church. But they never do. No. They, it's just like a, a fire insurance policy to them. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, I, when, I, when I worked at the hospital a long time ago, I, I was kind of surprised because there was a baby who was dying. And they, had, they called a, a minister in for an emergency baptism. Because that baby, unless it was baptized, was not going to heaven. So they had emergency baptism. So right then and there, they did whatever they did. They sprinkled the little the little child, and you know now it's safe. Now it's safe. Well, let me just ask you, seeing that we're on this subject, how does a baby get to heaven? 
How does what? Baby How does a baby get to heaven? So a baby dies at one, one breath old. How, how is a baby getting to heaven? Or is a baby getting to heaven? Yes. What happens to the baby? Baby goes to heaven. Why? God's grace. There it is. God's grace. How do you get to heaven? God's, God's grace. grace. Anything I do? Anything I've done? Anything I could do? I'm only getting to heaven because of what? The grace of God. So how does a baby get to heaven? The grace of God. But they have a sin nature like you do. What do you do with that? They're innocent. They don't know. Ah, they're innocent. They really have not had an opportunity to make a choice. They just don't know. So we honestly believe that a baby goes to heaven because of the grace of God, because sin has been paid for and they have not had the opportunity to accept or reject anything. They're just innocent. Is there any place in the Bible that refers to that? David. David. What? David, when the baby that Bathsheba had died, David said, when the baby came out, I saw the Lord and this place, but I will go. Okay, that's a good spot. Any any other spot that has reference? There's a passage that says um, something about the children's angels are always looking on the face of God. That I don't know. I've never heard uh, that one before. That yeah. yeah, that one I'm not sure of. Also Nineveh, because Nineveh had many innocents, the Bible called them, who did not know their right hand from their left. Right. Those are two good good places that we have reference to that children are referred to as innocent or could be seen as innocent. So when God was talking to Jonah about destroying Nineveh, you know, and Jonah had no compassion whatsoever, and the Lord actually drew reference to, well, what about those innocents? And that's how we refer to them, who did not know their right hand from their left hand. Does a baby know their right from their left? No. Well, they're innocent. They don't know. And they haven't had the opportunity to reject. But you talk in the religious realm, and, and I'm bringing up a controversial issue, which you and I should be very, very firm on. We should understand what this means and not be wishy-washy about it. We should be very secure in what we, we believe here. Because when you talk about something like this in the religious realm, there's many, many people that are not open to what we've just discussed. They're not open to that. They might as well be a mule. They might as well be a horse. You might as well put a bridle in their mouth to try to pull them in one direction or the next because they are not teachable. They're not open to anything. Now, I hope that each and every one of us remains always teachable. Right? Amen. Do you have all knowledge? Man, I don't. If you don't have all knowledge, then what you need to do and what I need to do is to remain what? In the word. Teachable. You need to be teachable. And that's a huge thing. And therefore, you would be considered good ground. You'd be good ground. Because I can throw I can throw the seeds out and it can fall on the good ground and it's gonna do what? Yeah, it, it's gonna grow and it's gonna produce fruit. And that's the point of the parable. Were the Pharisees teachable? Oh, heavens, no. Do we have pharisaical people in this world, especially in the religious world today? Whoa, yes, we do. Gene, you find what you're saying? Uh, yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Jay? So whenever I had discussions with my Catholic family about um, baptism, that baptism, you know, and I was taught this as a Catholic growing up, that it removes the original sin, because otherwise the gates to heaven are closed. And being baptized opened those gates, so now you can earn your way. So they have a solid answer 
it's not, I mean, it's not justifiable. I, I know that, but that's the, you know, and they just stay honed in on that. Yeah. It removes the original sin that Adam and Eve created. Yeah. And, and where does it actually say that? Yeah. Right. That's the problem. It doesn't. It, it doesn't say that. And, and this is where you need to go, you know, for you and I to be teachable, is you have to now make sure this is what the scripture really is saying. And, and, and remember, in whatever realm you happen to be in, whether you're a Mormon or a JW or a Catholic or a Protestant, I don't care. You know, they'll use the same book that we use, right? More or less. At least if they're claiming to be Christian, they'll use the Bible. And they'll have a verse to support their position. My Jehovah Witness brother had several verses to support his position. But when you look at all the scriptures that deal with the subject, his position was false. It was wrong. It was a corruption. <coughs> um, leading us here um, is, is a backstory, but um, that was that became the the defining point within the the church that we were going to was show me in here where that is true, and I will believe what you say. But if you can't show me in here and you tell me it's called faith, then, then I question that because everything should be provable in here. Yeah, and, and I think that's a good statement. The only trouble with the statement is, is if I pluck out a verse and I give it to you, then that's it because I plucked out a verse and I've given to you and I can rest my case because I got this verse. Well, you just can't accept a single verse. There you go. You got it, you got it. What do I always tell him? Context, context, context. There you go. Context and historical setting, right? Right. Who is it given to? Why is it given to? Right. You, you have good hermeneutical, we call it hermeneutical principles that bring you to right understandings or good interpretations. And there might be variations, okay, but you're not going to be dogmatically opposite. Okay. Yes, Gene. Matthew 18, 10. Okay. Take heed that all of you despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the faith of my Father which is in heaven. Okay. The little ones. Okay, the little ones. All right, thanks. I appreciate that. Yes. The Word of God is correction. There's times where um, particular scripture, I'll think, how come I got, I, I don't, I didn't believe it that way. It was like, you know, different nuance or whatever. And so the Word of God brought that to my mind to correct me. Yeah. Um, sometimes you well, well, but that's a teachable you heart. That, that's the point. Yeah. You, you have a teachable heart. And, and I don't care if you're 80 or 70 or 90 or 2. If you have a teachable heart, that's a good kind of heart to have. Now, you don't want to have a gullible heart. I'm not saying have a gullible heart. I'm not saying don't listen to other people. You know, I'm not saying that. I'm just simply saying you got to have a teachable heart, but you've got to actually conclude that when God says this, and you understand it correctly, then you need to do what? Do it. Obey what it says. Now that ultimately is the teachable heart. That ultimately is. Now people who understand and understand and understand, but never do, never do, never do, then yeah, you really don't have a teachable heart. You really don't. If you never get to the place of doing what it says, you don't really have a teachable heart. And that can include individuals, that can include nations, that can include denominations, that can include individual churches. Not teachable. So I hope as individuals and I hope as a church, we always remain teachable. We always remain teachable. Which means we have to have a, a conditioned of heart that's open once we understand the Word of God 
and we understand it correctly, that's what we do. That's ultimately what we do. Will we be perfect? Absolutely not. You're not going to find a perfect Christian who always does everything all the time, 100%. If you find him, his name is probably Jesus. <laughs> but it's not going to be Jay. It's not going to be Jay, right? It'll be Jesus. Yes? It's a little side trail, but I do think even as you grow as a Christian, you have to have an openness to change your position a little bit on some things because as you grow you have a better understanding of the passages and then you're like well okay what I thought you know two years ago or whatever I need to so approaching it with an open mind all the time which is sometimes challenging because we tend to like, right. go right to the same spot right, right? right. so <clears throat> yeah I think that's a good point and I think that's a very good point <laughs> But I want to, I personally want to have a kind of heart that doesn't necessarily stand still, but it just simply is open enough to be taught and ultimately change. And I'm hoping that in my, my little life of Christianity, it is, I've not stayed the same when I was 26 when, or 28 when I came to Christ than I am now 70 in Christ. I hope there's been an openness that... Well, from here to here, I've grown and I've learned and, and some things I have developed and, and some things I am fundamentally stationed on, I've built my life on, you know, because I really do understand this and I think I've got it right and, you know, that's what I'm doing. Uh, John 21, 25 says, and there are also many other things which Jesus did the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. There's a lot more to learn about our Lord that we have just in the book. Yeah. That's why I'm looking for the other side. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think there are things that the Spirit of God can can grow you in, teach you in, if you're open to that. But you're going to find every everything that's needed, everything that's foundationally true here. And if you can't find it here, then if you hear something that's out there and you say, well, I don't know if it's true, you need to find out whether it's true here and understand it correctly, you know, understand it correctly. And that's, uh, that's a challenge. That's why I think scripture says, study to show yourself approved. Rightly dividing what? Yeah, rightly dividing it. In, in other words, cutting it straight. And, and that's really a challenge. But that, that only is going to incur if you have the right kind of soil. <coughs> you got to have the right kind of soil. Okay, let's go on to number three. Enough time there. What do you think God meant in Psalm 32, 8, when he speaks of guiding us with his eyes? How does that work in practice? We're not out of his sight or care. He guides us. Okay. Guide, guide okay. Us. Walk in the spirit. Walk in the spirit. Yeah. Okay. There are times when I've, uh, I was working for a company that I did service work, drove a truck around and very things. And uh, we had an emergency call on a snowy Saturday. And I had to get up into Farmington to live in Redford. Well, I got on to I-96 and was traveling down I-96, and there was probably about three inches of snow on there. And I normally would go around using the expressways, but without thinking about it, I just had an urge to exit at Farmington Road. And when I did that, I'm going up the hill, I saw a car behind me just going around in circles. And if I had stayed there, he would run into me. So yeah. God watches us. Yeah, yeah, he, he does. Uh, has anybody spoken to another person through your eyes? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They can see the anger. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, your kids. You, you, your kids, you give them that look, right? And you know that if you don't shake them up, you are in big trouble. And you spoke all that 
with your eyes, right? Or if you're trying to sometimes communicate with somebody, you can, you know, give them a glance or do something or other, and all right, you look over to Jeff and say, your turn. You know, it's. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff looks back on. <laughs> but we're, we're communicating, right? right? And we're not saying anything, but we're just doing it, you know, through, through our eyes. So we're, we are not out of sight of God's care. We're just simply not out of his sight. It implies the consistency and perseverance of God's goodness toward us. That's what, you know, you're not out of his sight. And he keeps watch over us and guides us as he sees what is necessary in our lives. He will guide us with the gentle guidance of his eye. We could say as a contrast to the bit and the bridle. A look is enough for those who are willing to go in the right direction. So he doesn't necessarily have to pull us. All you have to do is look at us, right? And, and that's going to come, obviously, through the Word of God, honestly, with an open heart, with a kind of heart that's, that's teachable. And it's going to come, obviously, with the prodding of the Spirit of God. Anybody ever had the prodding of the Spirit of God? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's not the prod, it's like a foot. <laughs> Whatever it is, you know, he uses your conscience. You know, you have something built into you. He's just built some things into you that are just unique to humanity, to me. So he's given us the ability to know God, and he's given us a conscience. And sometimes in your conscience, you can be prodded and say, you know, I don't think that's right, or I got a bad feel about this, or I don't feel comfortable about this, or whatever it happens to be. And you know, what's not comfortable for you might be okay for me, but it's you that he might be dealing with. It, it's you that he might be priding. It's you that maybe you haven't grown to a certain level, so right here where you are, he's going to now work with you right here, right there. And, and that's a little bit unique, um, and, and I can't explain all that, um, but I know that the Spirit of God actually convicts. What does he do to convict? To me, he uses our conscience. You know, he just, it can make me feel guilty. You've ever been made feel guilty? <laughs> yeah. Have you ever, have you ever been felt as though, yep, this is, this is right? Mm -hmm. And you just have a confirmation in your heart that, yeah, I, I really, I don't see anything contrary to the word. Skip. Yeah. Well, part of that is, under the new covenant, it's planted in our hearts. Yeah, you have a new nature. The, the new nature, right. the understanding right. between right and wrong, right. the ability to make those decisions, right. it's given to us. Yeah. I don't care who you are or what your religion is, you know the difference between right and wrong. Right. It's how you act on that knowledge. Yeah, and that would be a teachable heart. Yes. That would be the kind of heart that's easily directed. Easily directed. And some people are stubborn. You know, they're not easily directed. They're very difficult to work with. And so, you know, does the Lord put on a bridle? I don't know, maybe he does. I don't know. I was stubborn for a long time. Yeah, well, a lot of us are. You know, there, there aren't anybody that's probably not stubborn at a time or two. Well, the really good part about the Spirit for me is, like, he, he follows you about everywhere, right? So there's no, like, even in the, when you're not in a public setting and, and you've got something you're thinking or something you're saying to yourself or whatever, he's following you around. He's like, no, Matt, that's not the way we're supposed to be doing things. <laughs> yeah, so there is, you might say, there is a difference between eye guiding and the bit in the bridle. Well, the bit in the bridle, that's more worldly, isn't it, where you have will lead you instead of listening. Well, there's, the, the Lord can really, I mean, if he needed to guide you through a bit or a bridle, can he do that? 
Yeah. In other words, what is what what's the difference here? Look at a shepherd's book. Okay, that would be a good example, right? <laughs> or over here, or a call. Come on, sheep, this way. And one's out there and said, okay, sheep, this way, right? There's a difference. I, I mean, he's going to bring it. He's going to bring it either way. But which way do you want to go? Which way would you rather go? A bit or right away or an I way? And I'm just saying, it's the condition of heart that's going to really matter for you. The condition of heart. What kind of heart do you really have? So we read, uh, let me read, uh, what time is it? I, I'm going to get away. Quarter two. Quarter two. Okay, but let's stop there. We didn't get very far, but it's a good subject for me. It's a really good kind of subject because we want to have this kind of good soil in our hearts. Okay, we'll, we'll start up there. Thank you for your time. Okay, see you. Oh.